The following program is a presentation of the Civil War Broadcasting Network, available on the free YouTube channel General Grant by himself, by Dr. E.C. Fields, on the Facebook page Kurt Fields, as General Ulysses S. Grant, and on various other social media. Permission to copy and distribute is granted and indeed is encouraged. Remember, you are the future of our past. And now, in the ongoing series, General Grant looks at the American Civil War, Brigadier General Ulysses S. Grant, from his camp near Fort Henry on the Tennessee River, reflects on his capture that day of Fort Henry. February the 6th, 62. General Halleck, Fort Henry is ours. The gunboats silenced the batteries before the investment was completed. I think the garrison must have commenced the retreat last night. Our cavalry followed, finding two guns abandoned in the retreat. I shall take and destroy Fort Donelson on the 8th and return to Fort Henry. Fort Henry and Fort Donelson are in the center of the essential Confederate defensive line. It runs from Columbus, Kentucky, where General Leonidas Polk has about 12,000 Confederate troops. It's all the way to Cumberland Gap, the Appalachian Mountains, but essentially this line of defense, set up by Albert Sidney Johnston, commanding the Confederate forces, runs from Columbus, Kentucky, to Bowling Green, Kentucky, northeast of it, where Simon Bolivar Buckner commands about 4,000 troops. In the center of that defensive line are the two forts, Fort Henry on the Tennessee River and Fort Donelson on the Cumberland River. Both are absolutely critical, both to the defense of the Confederacy here in the Western Theater and to the federal efforts to take the Western Theater. Albert Sidney Johnston recognizes the criticality of this area, and back in the summer of 61, in the fall, authorized the building of this fort. Actually, there are two forts here. Fort Henry is on the lower level next to the river, too close to the river, it flooded, and Fort Hyman is a sister fort on the west bank of the river, an earthen uh, fortification hastily built and hastily abandoned on the 4th of February when they found out that we were coming. But it was to provide plunging crossfire with Fort Henry. Fort Henry is to guard the Tennessee River, which flows, actually it's flowing north here in West Tennessee up to the Ohio and Mississippi Rivers. But it is to block any federal traffic coming south into the Tennessee River and Tennessee, Mississippi, all the way through Alabama. Fort uh, Donaldson is on the Cumberland River, and it's to protect the Cumberland River and any traffic going into Nashville, which is the capital of the state of Tennessee. Uh, and it would be a plum indeed to capture Nashville, Tennessee. So it doesn't take great military acumen to realize that Fort Henry and Donaldson are critical. They're the center of the Confederate defensive line from Columbus to Bowling Green, Kentucky. We determined we need to get them. During a demonstration back in November, uh, General Charles Ferguson Smith came to me and said he'd been in this area during that demonstration and he saw that we could take Fort Henry uh, and uh, advocated me to put that idea before General Halleck, which I began to do. I think it's a good idea. Uh, I requested permission to go see General Halleck, and I did, and, and, and perhaps I wasn't expressing myself as well as I could, but in the midst of what I was saying, he abruptly cut me off and said, this is nonsense. I'll return to your command, General. And I was greatly taken aback and returned to my command. But I've been talking with Flag Officer Andrew Cole Foote, 
uh, commanding the flotilla, the uh, Western flotilla of gunboats uh, on the Mississippi. They're under Army command, but General uh, Flag Officer Foote is eager to cooperate with me, and he likes the idea of taking Forts Henry and Donaldson as well. Now, on the 28th of February, after having talked with Flag Officer Foote, I sent a telegram to, or January the 28th, I, I should say, uh, to General Halleck and said to Major General Halleck, with permission, I will take Fort McHenry, I said Fort McHenry, on the Tennessee and hold and establish a large camp there. On the same day, Flag Officer Foote sent General Halleck this telegram, January 28, 1862. Grant and myself are of the opinion that Fort Henry on the Tennessee can be carried with four ironclad boats and troops to permanent occupied. Have we your authority to move for that purpose? Now, Flag Officer Foote carried much more gravity with uh, General Halleck than I. He replied to my, uh, Flag Officer Foote the next day and said, I am waiting for General Smith's report, Charles Ferguson Smith under my command, uh, on the road from Smithland to Fort Henry. As soon as that is received, we will give order. Meantime, have everything ready. When Flag Officer Foote told me that, I was very excited. I thought this is pretty much uh, a green light to go. Foote replied the same day to General Halleck, I have this instant received your telegram in relation to Fort Henry and will be ready with four ironclad boats to leave here early on Saturday. Lieutenant Commander Phelps of the Conestoga has been here for a day or two and in consultation with General Grant, we have come to the conclusion that the Tennessee will soon fall as the Ohio is falling above, and therefore it is desirable to make the contemplated movement the latter part of this week. Four mortars and beds are en route from Pittsburgh, and more will soon be forwarded. I send Lieutenant Pritchard with orders to report to you agreeable to suggestion to General Grant. It is said that the road from Paducah to Fort Henry, or opposite, is good even at this season. And the next day, on January 30th, Major General Halleck sent to me, make your preparations to take and hold Fort Henry. I will send you written instructions by mail. It was approved. Flag Officer Foote and myself were elated and we began to prepare immediately. I was going to take nearly 17,000 troops there uh, down the east side of the river. General Smith to take more across on the eastern side of the river to take Fort uh, Hyman. And uh, we were ecstatic. The fleet that Flag Officer Andrew H. Foote pulled together was of seven. There were four ironclads and three tinclads. His ironclads were his flagship, the Cincinnati. They were the Lexington. Uh, no, the Lexington was a tin, uh, timber clad. The Essex, the St. Louis, the Carondelet, and his flagship, the Cincinnati. So the ironclads were the Essex, the St. Louis, the Carondelet, and he was aboard the Cincinnati. They were of the city class of ironclads, there were a total of seven. With him, he also had three timber clads, which were the Conestoga, the Lexington, and the Tyler. So they, he got his flotilla up and ready to move. I had nine vessels to take my uh, nearly 17,000 troops from Cairo to uh, right across on the east side of the river uh, just about three miles north of Fort Henry on the Tennessee side of the river. And I was shuttling back and forth from Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, but we got all of those troops over, uh, over on the 4th and the 5th, and I was greatly excited. On the 4th, I wrote Julia a letter. On board the steamer Uncle Sam, 
Tennessee River, February 4, 62. Dear Julia, I am just now returning to Paducah after the troops from that place having landed the Cairo troops within three miles of Fort Henry in Tennessee. I went up this morning on one of the gunboats, the Essex, to reconnoiter the fort. A few shots, there were six, were exchanged with what effect upon the enemy it is impossible to say. Some of our shells went into the fort while one of the enemies passed through the cabin of the boat that I was on. Went right through the cabin. Done no harm, however. All the troops will be up by noon tomorrow and Friday morning, the 6th, if we are not attacked before, the fight will commence. The enemy are well fortified and have a strong force. I do not want to boast, but I have a confident feeling of success. You will soon hear if my presentiment is realized. I'm sorry now that I did not let Fred come up and return on one of the boats that will be going back. My anxiety will be great tonight, being at Paducah whilst my forces are almost within cannon range of the enemy, and that too in inferior numbers. Nothing further to write that can interest you. Don't know when you may look for me back. I will write you by every opportunity. You're viewless. So we had gone up, Captain Porter commanding the Essex, to draw the fire from Fort Henry because we wanted to see what their range was and what our range needed to be, the positioning of the fleet when it moved upriver going south and approaching Fort Henry. The next day, I wrote Julia another letter. Camp near Fort Henry. This is the night before we're going to attack. February 5th, 62. Dear Julia, we returned today with most of the remainder of our troops. I have made my second shuttling back. The sight of our campfires on either side of the river is beautiful and no doubt inspires the enemy who is in full view of them with the idea that we have full 4,000 men. I should have written 40,000. Tomorrow will come the tug of war. One side or the other must tomorrow night rest in quiet possession of Fort Henry. What the strength of Fort Henry is, I do not accurately know, probably 10,000 men. General Tillman was reporting 2,610 present for duty, I found out afterward. Tonight, our reconnoitering parties had a little skirmishing resulting in one killed and two slightly wounded on our side, and one killed and a number wounded on the side of the rebels, and the balance badly frightened and driven into their fortification. I am well and in good spirits, yet feeling confidence in the success of our enterprise. Probably by the time you receive this, you will receive another announcing the result. I received your letter last night just after I had written you. I have just written my order of battle. I hope it will be a report of the battle after it is fought. Kiss the children for me. Kisses for yourself. Eulis. So on early on the 6th, we began to move down the east side of the river, north of Fort Henry. I was with General McClernand. General Lou Wallace is involved as well. And the plan was that we're going to come and invest the fort while Foote's naval squadron, the seven vessels, bombard it and they surrendered to us. It didn't go exactly as planned. The plan was that at noon, all of this, or at 11 o'clock or so, all of this would commence in joint combined arms of the Army, Infantry, and the Navy assault. But very nearly at noon, Admiral Foote, or Flag Officer Foote, later Admiral Foote, uh, seeing no sign of the Army, decided to open fire anyway. He assumed that we would come up, which we did. He moved in, he began firing at about 1,700 yards and then moved into a range of just 300 yards. 
He's facing Ford Henry, which is a five-sided Ford, facing the river. There at Ford Henry, the, the land goes a bit into the Tennessee River, giving a field of fire north and south. He's looking north with the river is flowing north. The flotilla is coming downstream or coming upstream against the current in a southerly direction. Fort Henry has uh, 17 guns, about three acres inside the fort, about a 10 acre area altogether. The walls are 20 feet thick at the base, narrowing to 10 feet at the parapet at the top, and they're 20 feet wide. So, uh, or at the base, 20 feet thick at the base, 20 feet high, 10 feet across at the parapet. With those heavy guns, nine guns facing the river, six guns facing the landward to the east, the landward side. Uh, but by the time we got there, or Admiral Flag Officer Foote got there, the water had uh, really had an effect. There had been heavy rains for the last few days. The Tennessee River is way up, much over normal. Now, that means there is a great deal more volume of water and the current is flowing faster. For the, one of the first times, I believe the first time, the rebels have employed torpedoes in the water. But three things went wrong with that. First of all, the current is going so fast, it tore away many of them. Another issue is the water is so high that the boats of Admiral or Flag Officer Foote's uh, squadron flotilla went over the torpedoes that weren't torn away. And of the ones that were still in place, many of them leaked. Gunpowder was wet, they were no avail. So even though it's the first time or one of the first times that torpedoes have been used, they were not successful at all because of weather conditions and powder getting wet in them. But the fort, we think, has 10,000 men in it. And it's a, a, a massive structure, earthen fort. But uh, by the time the bombardment began, the Tennessee River has risen and the fort is so low next to the river that there are two feet of water inside the fort. And only nine of the guns were above the water. About a 75 minute artillery battle took place. All of the guns in the fort were uh, disemplaced. There was uh, severe uh, damage to the gun crews. They were all knocked out of position and a, a great deal of the gun crew, uh, many of the gun crew were wounded. Uh, there were a number of hits on the flotilla. As they came south, the four ironclads were bow on to the fort, which meant that only 18 guns could be brought to bear on the fort. Now that's out of a total of 54 guns on those four ships, but 18 guns brought to bear. They were four abreast bow on. Behind them were the three timber clads firing over and between them with less accurate fire because of the distance back. But after about 75 minutes, Tillman surrendered. Now the issue is he had almost 4,000 men in the fort. When word comes to him on the 4th that we are moving on his works, he knew what situation he had. They evacuated Fort Hyman on the West Bank, which was never finished anyway, a half-hearted attempt at best. And he sent all of those men to Fort Donaldson on the Cumberland, 12 miles east of us. And he kept actually about a hundred men to demonstrate that we weren't, from his point of view, we weren't afraid of the Federals and uh, they were gonna make them pay for what they got, make the cost as high as possible. So uh, he kept his hundred or so men. They surrendered, I think, 94 men. But after 75 minutes with their casualties uh, rising, all of their guns were knocked out he ran up a, a white flag, I think a sheet, and surrendered. Flag Officer Foote 
sent a boat, a dinghy, into the boat actually left the Cincinnati and sailed into the fort. Uh, that's how much water was in the fort. The men were literally up to their knees in the water. So they go back to the Cincinnati. There was uh, General Tillman, his aide, a captain, 12 staff officers, and some 65 or so men there. Most of them were sick. It turns out that they were, most of them were armed with flintlock muskets left over from the War of 1812. And uh, they were taken to the Cincinnati. Uh, he asked for terms, and Flag Officer Foote said there are no terms but unconditional surrender. And uh, Tillman accepted that and surrendered. Now, when while this is going on, uh, they began the assault at about noon, 75 minutes or so of active cannonading back and forth, and we're listening to the uh, artillery as we're trying to come south and encircle the fort, but because of those same heavy rains, we had a terrible time getting through the mud and were greatly delayed. And when I got there at about three o'clock, uh, I found that it had already been surrendered. So I was happy to congratulate Flag Officer Foote and uh, wrote the quick telegram that I did that I sent to General Halleck. Another significant issue with Fort Henry is it is the first time that these new ironclad boats have been tested in combat. That is a Navy milestone, a historical milestone. They fared well. All of them were hit. Uh, the Essex, though, took a shell amidships in the boiler. It exploded, uh, scalded, wounded, killed 32 of the sailors. Captain Porter, commanding, was one of those men that was severely wounded. And the, the old salts, as they call themselves in the Navy, are telling my soldiers that the Essex is, is out. She, she is not going to be uh, able to be rebuilt but she is out of commission at least for this campaign because next, as I told uh, General Halleck, uh, in two more days I'm moving on Fort Donaldson and I will reduce it, quickly return to uh, Fort Henry. After the battle, uh, Flag Officer Foote sent Lieutenant Commander Phelps with the three timber class at Conestoga, the Lexington, and the Ticonderoga or rather the Lexington, the Conestoga, and the Tyler, down the Tennessee River, and they went as far as Florence, Alabama. A couple of things that, well, one thing they did and one thing they didn't do. They captured the uncompleted Confederate ironclad East Port, near East Port, Mississippi. But they captured the East Port and destroyed it. And that, that's what they did. What they didn't do was burn the town of Florence and the railroad bridge at Florence crossing the Tennessee River. The people of Florence, the mayor and leaders, begged him not to burn it. And uh, they were merciful. They did not burn Florence. Uh, I'm very concerned about not having destroyed that bridge, though. Uh, as we move into uh, West and Middle Tennessee, that bridge, that railroad bridge across the Tennessee at Florence, Alabama may well cause us some future problems. We, we will simply have to get to it, take it and hold it before the Confederates can. But the, the battle was 75 minutes and it was hours. Uh, Flag Officer Foote did well. The ironclads performed well. The Confederates saw what a grievous uh, engineering mistake that they had made in putting Fort Henry so close down to the level of the river. Uh, and the Tennessee River was open to federal invasion and control all the way to Florence, Alabama. And that will bode well for us. And it was, as I said earlier, the first significant federal victory uh, that we've had on January the 18th, the Battle of Mill Springs, 
General George Thomas won that in Kentucky, Mill Springs, Kentucky, and that was certainly a wonderful victory for our arms. Uh, and this is another significant victory for what all it entails. Now, I am ready to move on Fort Donaldson, and as I said, I think in a couple of days I'll take it. But this is my report about taking Fort Henry, my official report. Headquarters, District of Cairo, Fort Henry, Tennessee, February the 6th, 1862. Captain J.C. Kelton, Assistant Adjutant General of the Department of the Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri. Captain, Enclosed, I send you my order for the attack upon Fort Henry. Owing to dispatches received from Major General Halleck and corroborating information here to the effect that the enemy were rapidly reinforcing, I thought it imperatively necessary that the effort should be carried today. My forces were not up at 11 o'clock last night when my order was written, Therefore, I did not deem it practicable to set an earlier hour than 11 a.m. this morning to commence the investment. The gunboat started up at the same hour to commence the attack and engaged the enemy at not over 600 yards. In little over one hour, all the batteries were silenced and the fort surrendered at discretion to Flag Officer Foote, giving us all their guns, camp and garrison equipage, etc., the prisoners taken are General Tillman and staff, Captain Taylor and company, and the sick. The garrison, I think, must have commenced their retreat last night or at an early hour this morning. Had I not felt it an imperative necessity to attack Fort Henry today, I should have made the investment complete and delayed until tomorrow so we are so to have secured the garrison. I do not now believe, however, the result would have been any more satisfactory. The gunboats have proven themselves well able to resist a severe cannonading. All the ironclad boats received more or less shots, the flagship some 28, without any serious damage to any except the Essex. This vessel received one shot in her boilers that disabled her killing or wounding some 32 men, Captain Porter among the wounded. I shall take and destroy Fort Donaldson on the 8th and return to Fort Henry with the forces employed unless it looks feasible to occupy that place with a small force that could e retreat easily to the main body. I shall regard it more in the light of an advance grand guard than a permanent post. For the character of the works at Fort Henry, I will refer you to reports of the engineers which will be required. Owing to the intolerable state of the roads, no transportation will be taken to Fort Donaldson and but little artillery, and that with double teams. Hoping that what has been done will meet the approval of the General Commanding Department, I remain your obedient servant, U.S. Grant, Brigadier General. And that is the end of the reflection about Fort Henry on the Tennessee River. It was the first engagement of ironclads, a new weapon in the naval arsenal, in a new theater, Western naval combat, and they proved themselves well. It is the uh, beginning of the fall, I think, of the Confederacy, where we now have control of the Tennessee River and by uh, the 8th, just two more days, I will take Fort Donaldson and we'll have control of the Cumberland all the way into Nashville, Tennessee. Take the capital and that very strategic rail center. I am pleased with what has been able to be brought about today, particularly with our cooperation with the Navy from Flag Officer Andrew Hull Foote and the courageous actions of the federal soldiers and sailors who took this fort. And now, having said quite enough, I will take my leave of you. Our next meeting, though, will be what I do in just a couple of days with Fort Donaldson to take control of the Cumberland River. I bid you an affectionate farewell. <laughs>